So Adeline is going to be talking to us about Mars. And there's a reason why we decided that we were going to talk about Mars this month. And it's because um, Mars is important right now because next month it's about to be at a perihelic opposition. So this is cool for two reasons. When Mars is in opposition, that means that the sun is on one side of us in Earth and then the uh, Mars is on our other side on Earth. So that means that the sun is illuminating Mars um, in a way that we get to see it at, at basically its brightest that we would see. And the perihelic part of this opposition is what happens when a planet is at perihelion, which means that planet is uh, at its closest point to the sun. And when Mars is at perihelion, um, sometimes we're also aligned in a way that we are very close to Mars in its orbit, one of, the one of our closest points that we get to Mars. And so what that means is that the diameter of Mars looks larger in the sky. So Mars is bigger and brighter, and it becomes an excellent target for observing and for imaging. So um, we wanted to, to have that be the topic of tonight's meeting. Um, Addy is going to talk to us about Mars. And then after her talk, we're going to welcome feedback from everyone joining us on tips and tricks that you all have learned over the years for observing Mars. Any questions that come about during the talk, um, feel free to ask questions during the talk, but please type them in the chat. And I will, um, I will interrupt Addie at a good time in her presentation and ask the questions on your behalf. Uh, to those of you that are viewing from Facebook, also feel free to put the questions in the chat on Facebook. Just be aware there's a 30 second delay between our meeting that we're having and what you're seeing. So it, we might be a little bit awkward in our timing of, of responding to you, but we will, we will see what you write. Um, yeah, and with that being said, please welcome Adeline Cooper. Thanks guys. I'm gonna share my screen so that we can all look at the presentation that I made. So today I'm here to talk about Mars and all of the cool things that come along with that. Um, so some of the things that I'm going to talk about are some geological, um, you know, features of Mars as well as some of the astronomical phenomena as well as the um, just different pop culture references about Mars itself. Um, so first off, we're going to talk about observation methods. So I don't know if anybody heard earlier, but I don't have a camera and I don't do astrophotography. Um, but as far as observing marks goes, um, last month we went out and watched the um, meteor shower at Greaser Field and I actually saw Mars with my naked eye. It's really easy. Um, you know, it's the red star inside of the sky. Um, so um, it's been observed this way for a really long time. Um, I think that Mars was one of the first um, planets that, you know, was actually observed. So there are five planets that we can see with our naked eye, and Mars is the fourth luminous object in the sky right behind the sun, the moon, and Venus. Um, if you want to observe Mars with binoculars, you can as well, and you can get a pretty good look at it. You can't exactly get any surface features from it, but you can still get a pretty good view of it, um, considering that it's so far away from Earth. Um, and then obviously you can observe Mars through telescopes. Um, there's tons of telescopes that are taking pictures of Mars all the time. Um, so the first time that Mars was um, look, observed through a telescope was in 1610. Um, and Galileo was actually the first one to see Mars as a sphere. Um, so before Mars was identified as a planet, it was just called a wandering star because it changed position um, in the sky, night sky. Um, and of course, um, like we were saying, the Mars is becoming super illuminated from the sun because of the current position in the sky, as well as it's super duper close um, to us right now. So that's why it'll be good observing. Um, there are a ton of geographical phenomena that come along with Mars. 
So Mars has these crazy dust storms. Um, they're really interesting because the winds of the dust storms can get up to 100 miles per hour. On top of that, they can sometimes span the entire surface of the planet. So they're absolutely massive. Um, we've been observing Mars um, like lately with our technology, you know, we have a bunch of uh, satellites and rovers on Mars. So we're really paying attention to the changes in the geography. And one of the things that we do notice when we, you know, we wanna see how the geography changes before and after the dust storms. Um, another important thing to note about the dust storms on Mars is that usually they're more frequent whenever Mars is closer to the sun. Um, Olympus Mons is the name of the largest volcano on Mars. It's a shield volcano, and it's actually the largest volcano of any planet in the solar system, and it's the second largest volcano in the solar system. So it's absolutely massive. It's about the size of Missouri. So, um, like the whole entire state. So if you were actually on top of Olympus Mons, like you would not be able to see that it was so huge, like it's absolutely ginormous. Um, and um, the polar caps, so one of the biggest um, and easiest features to see of Mars is its polar caps, it's very prominent. Um, there's a lot of speculation uh, what's actually underneath the polar caps. They've found an abundance of um, helium under, like it just around, or hydrogen around the polar caps. So that's why a lot of people are speculating that the polar caps could have ice under them because there's so much hydrogen. Um, there's also a lot of uh, CO2 under the polar caps and that CO2, um, sometimes when it's phasing from a solid into a gas, it creates a ton of clouds around Mars. So when you see those really pretty pictures of the Martian clouds um, on the above in the atmosphere, then it usually it's from the CO2 that melts from the polar caps. Um, Mars also does not have a uh, magnetosphere um, it is believed that it was eroded by solar winds. So due to that, Mars can't hold an atmosphere, that in combination with the fact that there's very low pressure on Mars. Um, so that's why there is no liquid water currently on the Martian surface and why um, water just basically evaporates and um, goes away. They don't have, since there's no atmosphere, then there's no possibility for it to stay and then it just um, goes off into space. Um, oh, I went too far. So Phobos and Deimos. Um, Phobos and Deimos are Mars's two, um, two satellites, two moons. So they were both discovered in 1877 by Asaph Hall. Um, and they're also both non-spherical, which I found really, really interesting. So if you look at, you know, all the major celestial bodies, the moon, the earth, and everything else, they're basically circles and spherical. So, um, you know, the idea that Mars has two um, satellites that are both non-spherical was really interesting to me. Um, so there have been a lot of speculation on actually where Mar Mars's satellites came from. Um, one idea is that they may be um, ejected asteroids or they may have come from like some early impact on Mars and then stayed inside of its gravitational field. Um, so the first moon that I wanted to talk about was Deimos. Deimos is smaller than Mars, I'm sorry, obviously it's smaller than Mars. It's the smaller of the two um, and it's farther away. Um, so it is possibly that it was an asteroid that just fell into the Martian orbit and um, it is projected to escape its orbit eventually. And then Phobos is um, larger and it's closer to Mars and it's projected that sometime in the future, it may create rings around Mars. Um, sort of like we see on Jupiter or, or Saturn or Uranus. So 
So in pop culture, um, Mars pops up a lot. Um, so Mars is the Roman god of war and its moons, Phobos and Deimos are um, in Greek mythology, Aries is um, two sons, twin sons of fear and um, phobias. And um, there was a um, radio broadcast back um, in the early 1900s um, called War of the Worlds where um, there was a newscaster who um, was playing off of um, some old um, some old stories basically saying that Martians had landed on Earth and um, Basically, he he made it seem as if there was mass hysteria and that we were being invaded. Um, a lot of people believed him, um, but thankfully, the next day, the newscasters kind of clarified that we were not being invaded by Martians. Um, Mars also pops up a lot in science fiction when it comes to terraforming and living on other worlds because it's still somewhat in the habitable zone, even though it does not have an atmosphere for us to breathe. Um, and Mars just does a really good job of capturing our imaginations when it comes to, you know, space explor exploration and how we're going to uh, shape our future. Um, when I was in high school, there was a song that we played called Mars. It was this really uh, droning war march and it's really cool. Um, so a lot of the times Mars can be associated with war, but it also can be associated with new beginnings as in, you know, terraforming and moving on. And also, as everybody knows, um, SpaceX is the current, um, on the current pop culture scene, trying to get everybody to, um, you know, move to Mars and start all over. Um, currently, Mars has the most orbital satellites of any planet that's not Earth. So we have 14 satellites in orbit around Mars right now. And um, there have been so many missions to Mars and rovers that we've sent. Basically, anytime we send over rovers, we want to make sure that they can work as the scientists' hands and eyes and ears and just all their senses so we can get the most information. Um, we cannot currently place any rovers on Olympus Mons, um, which would be a really interesting place to go. Um, but there are plenty of other landing sites. And there are some ideas that we could possibly send astronauts to one of Mars's satellites, and then, um, you know, remotely uh, control any of the rovers that we send um, after that. Um, and a little bit over half of all missions that have been mounted to Mars have failed in some way. Um, but I think it's probably just because a lot of trial and error was um, needed in order to basically get to Mars and, um, you know, kind of figure out how we were going to do that um, just because, you know, Mars is so different from our own terrain. It takes about six months to get to Mars if we're at optimal positioning, but if we're kind of farther in our orbits, it could take up to a year. And here are some pictures of Mars that our other um, cast members have taken. Um, and I used a lot of these different um, references while learning about Mars for this talk. Thank you, Adeline, that was great. Um, I'm going to give some time for questions. We have a little bit of a lag in the Facebook. Um, I was going to, I don't know if Christopher is here today, but so on your last slide, one of those images is from our astrophotographer, Joe Renzetti. And this, the other one that was a little more reddish is from Christopher. I oh my to gosh. Yes. I'm so sorry. There. I forgot to credit I, him. I forgot to send you the name. So that's my fault. But Joe is here. Thank you for your picture, Joe. Um, are there any questions or are there any comments? What's your favorite fact about Mars? Did you learn something new? How about you, Addie? What, what was the coolest thing you learned? 
So one of the things I really liked learning about Mars was about Phobos and Deimos not being spherical because I read that in Astrophysics for People in a Hurry by Neil deGrasse Tyson. And basically it has to do with the, um, well, I think it has to do with the um, surface tension or the surface pressure. So uh, he was saying that like the pressure that it takes to create like a planet sized um, object is so intense, but they're thinking that they're not spherical because they didn't have that same amount of pressure. Also the idea that Mars could have rings one day is really cool. Bob says in the chat, Mars is the only planet in our solar system that is inhabited by robots. Yes, because I was reading about getting robots to Venus and there have been a lot of issues doing that too. So he's right. I liked your um, your slide, not the title, but like the caption under the title on your on your robot slide about <laughs> where, where many robots have gone before. I thought that was cute. I'm um, such a Star Trek nerd. <laughs> Tom, Tom K is asking, how bad will the dust clouds be next month? That's a really good question that I don't have the answer to. <laughs> well, okay. What part of our orbits are we in to, um, to the sun? Because if it's closer to the sun, it's more likely. It's what I read. Um, so yeah, it's getting really close. Yeah, so it may, there may be one, but we hope it'll be clear. Uh, why can't we land rovers on Olympus Mons? It's not convenient. Like Olympus Mons, I think it's because there's um, there's something about the terrain where it's just not as easy to land there as other places. I also, in my research, I saw that in order for us to launch a rover and get it to Mars in the exact spot we want, that's like shooting a basketball from LA to New York and then getting nothing but net. So Simon is asking, uh, wait, so is one of the moons on a collision course with Mars? Yeah, it's, um, it's actually in a decaying orbit. So um, that just means that they don't think that it's actually going to impact. They think it's just going to burn up and then create the rings. I just realized it's a little bit absurd for me to be moderating questions when we all can just unmute and have a conversation. <laughs> so, so I'm going to stop. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Benjamin has a question, so I'm going to put him on the spot and ask him to uh, to ask it. Wow. Okay. This is big. This is big for me. Right. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned when the planet's closest to the sun at perihelion that the dust storm is more intense or it's more frequent. Do you did you read at all why that would be? I'm struggling to understand why. I don't remember off the top of my head. I remember asking myself if it had to do with solar wind. Um, right. Cause I do know that Mars is really affected by solar winds, um, especially since it no longer has a magnetosphere. Absolutely. So maybe. <laughs> Ovia, yep, Ovia. And isn't it interesting that like, we named the planets after the Greek gods like all of those years ago. And then like, you know, Phobos and Deimos weren't discovered until like 1877. And so Mars has twin suns, but like the actual planet has twin satellites. <laughs> I have a question on how many of folks who observe Mars have seen Phobos and, v and Vimo, Timos in, the, in a telescope? Because I don't know too many who have. <laughs> so, no, never. Any, any volunteers here have seen it? <laughs> seen them? There are, I think they're what, around 12th magnitude, Brad. I'm not sure. They're 13th. They're pretty faint. So, right. Yeah. That would be a challenge. You'd have a good chart, good timing for it. I think you have to generally make something to occult the brightness of Mars. 
Right, that too, because they're so close. So. Well, I think it's it wouldn't be that difficult in the grand scheme because I know at least one of them has an orbital period of twice a day. It comes, it rises and sets twice a day. So it would probably be a lot easier to observe it than some other. Well, the separation of the planet from uh, the moons from the planet are such that there's not a, a large separation. And that's the one problem. The other problem is uh, a lot of us are uh, power challenged. We don't have the ideal observing conditions for the power that we need to see those things. So it's a really a tough object. Uh, I'll tell you truthfully, the only time I like observe Mars is to make sure my finder scope is collimated with my telescope, and that's about it. Were there any Facebook questions? Doesn't. No, no Facebook questions yet. I think it's cool that Mars has the biggest volcano in the system, like, of the planets. Yeah, I, I knew it was big, but uh, you said it, it's, it's about the size of Missouri, was that it? It is the size of Missouri. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> if you put Mount Everest next to um, Olympus Mons and like down as far as it goes, like it's a molehill in comparison. It would be too ragged to land a rover on Olympus Mons anyway, wouldn't it? I don't know if it's that it's ragged. I think there's some kind of, um, there is some reason, you know what? The ground is tilted. The, internet. the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. ground is slightly the tilted. Thinner, the thinner atmosphere is even thinner. It's yeah. so high. That could be part of it, too. <clears throat> you just think, wouldn't even want to land on something like that. It's just not level ground. I think Judy has a question. Good evening, Adeline. Thank you uh, for your presentation. I really appreciate that. I'm a first year cast member, so <laughs> I'm learning a lot of things. <laughs> um, my question for you is, um, could you tell us a little bit more about your research and how um, you came to be interested in, in, in Mars? Um, that is a really great question. So, um, I decided to do the Mars talk because I am also a first year cast member and um, nobody was gonna do it. And I was like, you know what, I'll do it. Um, like I haven't like done a lot in the realm of science yet. Um, I actually joined cast because I wanted to become an astronomer and I decided to go where the astronomy was. And then, um, you know, I met Ness and Brad and literally everybody else here and Isaac and everybody just really encouraged me. And so um, that was like a really positive uh, thing for me. Thank you. That's what happens when you join CAS. It's like an unexpected side effect of sometimes you go on to uh, be a professional astronomer. Um, you did great. You, so you've been studying astronomy for three weeks now. Is that right? Yep, I've been studying astronomy for three weeks, and I'm currently trying to, uh, like, my I put in my bio that I wanted to do something with like waves, like optics or radio astronomy. But um, currently in like Polaris class, um, my other mentor Samson, he um, is currently doing. Um, you know, stuff with gravitational lensing. And so I decided I wanted to do a project like that. So like, that's the um, kind of project that I'm doing like in school. And if you don't mind me asking, what school are you in? LSU. Yes, yes, I'm a, I'm a graduate there. I'm yeah. a graduate. I'm really excited to be a Buckeye. I am so excited. Like, you guys have no idea how excited I was when I came to CAS and like, I was like, hi guys, I want to study astronomy. And they're like, well, the president is doing a PhD at OSU in astronomy. <laughs> Great. 
Yep, I got I got a BA degree in there, computer and information science. All right, so I have a feeling that a lot of really fun conversation is going to blossom. I think we should try to wrap up questions. Um, if there are any more questions, and then we can move on to observing tips and tricks from people who've been doing this for a while, and then we can end the Facebook feed and just hang out as uh, friends on the chat. Does that sound, or on the Zoom, does that sound okay for everyone? That's good. Okay. All right, so are there any final questions for, for Adeline? I'll give it about 30 seconds for Facebook, but we haven't had anything on Facebook yet. And uh, the last thing is, it's because Mars doesn't have an atmosphere, so the landers can't land, land safely closer to on the, that's why. It's a problem with the landing. I wonder, so do you know why the storms last so long? Is that also a lack of atmosphere thing? I don't know about that, because I wasn't actually, I didn't read that much about the dust storms. Like, I was like, wow, 100 miles per hour, that's really cool. But I was, like, way more interested in learning about Olympus Mons and the, the two moons. <laughs> hmm. So, uh, sorry, this this kind of made me wonder. Um, so I, I know it's kind of an issue to land things on Mars because the atmosphere is so thin. Uh, do you think the atmosphere is actually thinner on the top of Olymp Olympus Mons just because it's so tall, which probably makes it even more difficult? the land stuff there? Um, that makes a lot of sense to me. Because, I mean, just thinking about how, like, Mars has no atmosphere, I don't think it would get more atmosphere further away from the planet. But, like, the atmosphere on Mars is so thin, um, and basically the pressure is so low that basically if you were to go there without any kind of, like, pressure suit, you're bodily fluids would start to boil, like not from the heat, just from the low pressure. So like your saliva and your tears. Actually, there was, um, it was a NASA experiment where they were trying to work on the pressure suits and somebody's pressure suit ripped. And he said he could feel his saliva boiling. <laughs> I know it's really gross and worrisome. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't sound very pleasant. Yeah, it but it's really interesting for like, you know, to think that you know, like we live in Earth and we're just so used to this is like our default, but there are other places where it's totally different. It's said to be roughly the equivalent of the pressure of Earth's atmosphere at about 100,000 feet above sea level. All right, so um, that will wrap up our talk from Adeline. So everybody congratulate Adeline. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, Thank you. Thank you. So uh, does anyone want to share observing experiences or tips or tricks since we're all, all we're all inspired to go observe the red planet now? I, I grabbed some stuff and uh, I'm willing to share a few things here. Is that <laughs> everybody good with that? Okay. Yeah, that's great. Okay, that's good. I just didn't get a, a response <laughs> there. Everybody's like, oh, him again. Oh, God. <laughs> um, no. Okay. No, we're looking forward to it. Thank you. So, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, I, I, I did a quick uh, uh, Google of uh, a number of different things and wanted to kind of share with you a, little, a few tips. One of the things uh, that Adeline touched on is that Mars is actually a, a smaller planet than Earth, and even though it gets fairly close to Earth, uh, during its opposition, it doesn't really get all that large. Um, by comparison, the, si the apparent size of Jupiter in the sky is uh, roughly 45 arc seconds. That's just a unit of distance in the sky. Uh, uh, Mars, on the other hand, at its very largest, only gets to 25 arc, arc seconds, which is you know, not quite, you know, a little bit more than half. Uh, this time around, it will be getting up to uh, around opposition, which is the, first, the second week in October. It'll be getting to about 24 arc seconds in size. This is not the closest possible approach, but it's pretty close. So Mars is, is pretty small, and it's subject to um, the unsteadiness. When, when looking at it through a telescope, it's subject to the unsteadiness of 
Earth's atmosphere. Um, so when you look up at the night sky, you see the stars twinkle and that kind of thing. That's the light of the sky, uh, the light from the from the heavens passing through um, the uh, Earth's atmosphere and getting jostled and distorted. And so if you look at a if you look at Mars in a telescope, um, even when the telescope is at pretty high power, you'll see something a little bit like this. I found this little video here on YouTube. Um, can everybody see that? Let me. Are, am I sharing my screen? Let me uh, let me share my screen here. Share screen. There we go. Share. Okay. Hopefully uh, you guys can see the see this little video. Can everybody see it? Give me a thumbs up. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. So um, this is just somebody that posted a, a little a video on YouTube. They stuck a camera on their on their telescope, and one of the things you'll notice first of all is it's not a very sharp image. Um, uh, I will compare that with another image here that was taken by a one Joe Renzetti, member of the Columbus Astronomical Society, which shows quite a bit of detail. Uh, and you can also see other images here. Uh, let me, uh, you know, ones like this that were taken with the Hubble Space Telescope up out of the atmosphere with a very big telescope, lots of image processing and that kind of thing going on. So compare that those images to this, which is what you'd probably end up seeing. So something like this. This is actually a video of Mars taken through a telescope, and you'll notice that you're getting a lot of shimmering and that kind of thing that's going on. Uh, let me back it up here again. And the guy splits it into three channels here. And that's caused mainly, uh, I, would, I would guess in this case, by the unsteadiness of Earth's atmosphere. Now, a uh, people who do astrophotography can actually take this video and carefully process it and get you know details out of that. So this particular astro imager uh, took this took this video and then carefully found all the details in this with a with a with a piece of software. They usually use something called Registax, and they imaged it uh, to bring out some of the details. Um, You'll notice a few things that you can actually see. I'll go back to Joe's picture because it's this year. Um, here, let me let me show you Joe's picture once again. Um, you'll see that uh, you can you can see one of the polar caps. That's of course a uh, uh, a polar cap made uh, mainly of carbon dioxide. There might be a little bit of water ice in there as well down deep. Uh, but when uh, one of the poles of Mars goes into winter, it develops a polar cap. And then what ends up happening is when that reemerges into the sunlight, that polar cap slowly starts to fade away. So this was taken uh, several weeks ago and at, at a time when the, polar, when the polar cap was actually looking pretty big. And um, but what you'll notice over time, if you, if you observe carefully, is that this, that, that this will shrink over time. So, Brad, is that south up or north up? It's south up currently. So that's the, the Newtonian view, and that that's the Newtonian view. Yes. Okay. So, um, so you've got uh, Certus Major here. This is the uh, um, the most prominent feature. This was actually the first feature on another planet discovered, uh, and then the polar cap. And then there's a region here called Hellas, which sometimes fills up with fog. So. There's another reason why you might want to, uh, um, uh, you know, be careful with the way you observe. I'll, I'll, I'll show a, an image here. Um, if you're observing with a reflecting telescope, um, sometimes reflecting telescopes contribute to the blurriness of the view. Um, if you're if you're looking through a, a, a reflecting telescope, you're actually looking through. Um, the air that is trapped in the tube of the telescope. And what this uh, little video here that I'm going to show you is what's called a Schlieren test. Uh, a Schlieren test uh, basically uses a, a light source that uh, goes down and hits the, uh, the mirror of the telescope and then comes back and then um, you're able to see the, uh, 
uh, differences in density in the air between you and the telescope. It's a little more complicated than that, but uh, the, by and large, you can actually see the heat of something um, in the in the path of the light. So when you uh, stick your hand there, you'll notice you've got all these little ripples and things like that coming off the off the uh, off your hand. If your telescope happens to be warm, or even the mirror itself happens to be warm, it will also produce these ripples um, in the um, in the in the in the field of view and with a uh, with a telescope um, that is a reflecting telescope that's doubly important because with a reflecting telescope what ends up happening oops there's my I had my uh, other software here I had I'm doing about three things at once I apologize so when you have a reflecting telescope here this is Brian Greer uh, who was actually very uh, interested in uh, uh, telescope optics what ends up happening is the light goes down and hits the mirror and passes through that telescope tube with all the warmth in it and then it comes back and passes through it again so it actually gets hit by that by that stuff twice so another piece of advice in uh, observing the, uh, the, the the planet is you know it's small so you got to magnify a lot but also make sure that your telescope is cooled down make sure that you've set it out an hour or two before you're going to observe and that the telescope no longer has any heat relative to the um, to the observing outside uh, to the uh, n uh, relative to the um, ambient air temperature and your views will be a lot better uh, in that case. And the final thing that is uh, particularly interesting, I, I let me see if I can find it. Uh, I think I closed that page, I apologize. Collimation, okay, there we go, is you need to make sure that um, your telescope is properly collimated. Um, this thing right here is an image uh, taken through a telescope that has a mirror, um, not a not a refracting telescope. And these guys are the are star images taken through that telescope. I, obviously, these are idealized, computer-generated images. Um, but what they are is showing you what the image of a star would look like um, if if the telescope was lined up in a certain way, collimated in a certain way. What you need to do is you need to make sure that the center of your mirror is pointed um, directly at the center of your uh, uh, field of view. Where you're, when you're looking through the eyepiece, you're actually looking straight down the uh, axis of the center of the mirror. If you're not doing that, if the mirror is tilted a little bit off to the side and you're looking a little bit off to the side, the, the star image will actually be distorted a little bit. Um, so you'll get a, this little sort of distortion here and if it's really off the distortion will be pretty great and what ends up happening is that actually ends up uh, causing a little bit of blurriness as well so you have to end up so you have to uh, collimate your telescope collimating your telescope involves um, aligning the this is a this this image right here is the field of view of your telescope looking down the eyepiece you know looking down the tube of the eyepiece and this is this ring right here is the secondary mirror and it's actually looking at the primary mirror and this particular image is a indication of a well collimated telescope because you're looking straight down the middle of the mirror the mirror is well centered the the reflection of your um, of your secondary mirror and your eyepiece is also well centered everything's all lined up and you're looking straight down the axis of that uh, of that um, of the mirror and your images will therefore be much sharper so basically keep your keep your uh, telescope cool keep it uh, well collimated and since Mars is very small you want to crank up the power pretty high um, a, a good uh, uh, magnification three or four hundred power is not out of the question uh, in terms of observing Mars so uh, that's pretty much what I've got for uh, tips and tricks on observing Mars. Oh, another thing is to make sure that you wait until Mars is fairly high in the sky. Um, when Mars is, uh, is uh, low in the sky, uh, the light of the planet is passing through a lot more air, and there, that makes it uh, uh, able to uh, 
that makes the air actually distort the image that much more. When Mars is at its highest point, which is near um, what's called maximum culmination, that's the point at which it crosses the north-south line of the sky, um, it is at its best. You know, that's actually when it's going to be highest in the sky. And on opposition, at opposition, that happens at about 1.30 in the morning for people in Ohio. Uh, the reason why it happens at 1.30 in the morning instead of midnight is, first of all, we have daylight savings time, which shifts midnight to the equivalent of 1 in the morning in October. And uh, we're not in the, in the uh, middle of the, uh, the time zone, so it takes Mars a little bit longer to rise up uh, in our skies um, yeah, for people that are observing in Ohio. So it takes an extra 30 or 35 minutes for Mars to get to its highest point. So about 1.35 in the morning at opposition is when it's at its best. If it's a little bit before opposition, it takes a little longer. So, I mean, you know, 2 in the morning and at the beginning of October and, uh, you know, 12.45 at the end of October uh, would be a good time to, you know, the best time to observe it. Uh, so that is uh, my tips and tricks for Mars. I will stop sharing my screen and pass it back right, right, to... Ed, but just to what you said just now, actually this op opposition, even though it's not quite the closest, is actually very good because it's very high. I think we would get to 60 degrees, 55, 60 degrees up at the highest. Whereas yeah, that is I very think it's like 54. Opposition, I think at one point it was only 30-something yeah. Uh, so we're in some ways a little better off with this opposition than, than uh, this time than we were uh, last time. Yeah, so this year is not the closest that Mars gets to the Earth. Uh, you know, the, we're not at perihelic opposition, as, as uh, Di was mentioning and Ness were mentioning. Um, but we're close enough to it that it, Mars still gets pretty big um, in the sky. And... But at the same time, it's not it, perihelic opposition occurs when Mars is very far south. Um, Mars is down in Sagittarius when it's at perihelic opposition. It only gets 15, 20 degrees up above the horizon um, at its best, and that makes it much harder to see. You need to go to Florida or South America or something and observe it at that time. But this time around, it gets up to 45, uh, 54 degrees above the, uh, above the horizon it's at its best. And uh, it's only a little bit smaller. So it's actually, even though it's a little bit smaller, we'll probably be able to see more detail as long as we don't get a dust storm. So. Thanks, Brad. No problem. <laughs> Um, does anyone else have anything they'd like to share about Mars? I I was just going to say um, one thing I have found really helpful is to not just take a quick look through the telescope, but if you can get really comfortable and stare at it for minutes at a time and try to integrate a couple seconds worth of... Uh, of viewing. I don't know what the human eye and brain are capable, but I know that you can integrate some amount of time and that can help you take advantage of times of good seeing. I have a question too, with Brad or anybody else, uh, who has play around with filters, you know, blue filters, orange filters, Whatever to get off, get the uh, the horizon haze or the haze at the poles that um, um, Edline was talking about, or uh, various features help with different filters. But I, I haven't played around with that much. But yeah. I know I, I, I know actually have a set of filters, and I played around with filters um, uh, quite a bit, and it um, it's kind of this is sort of an, a lost art uh, that people have. Uh, uh, that they're no longer uh, um, practicing these days. The uh, so filters are um, just basically little colored pieces of glass that you put in front of your eyepiece. And when you if you look through a filter, 
that changes your perception of color. So if you look through a red filter, it allows anything that's red to pass through and any, any other color gets blocked out and looks dark. And so if you have things that have that are roughly the same brightness, you know, if you have something that's red and something that's green that are roughly the same brightness and you put a red filter on, the contrast between the red and the green will be increased. And this is doubly so when the when the colors are sort of unsaturated, you know, they're they're just a little bit saturated. So I found that Mars actually a couple of different filters do a good job for certain things. If you're looking to look at the dark markings, that a sort of orangish filter kind of really helps a lot. Um, the, the the dark regions of Mars are not green as they seem to look in, in photographs. They're actually gray. They they don't they don't have any color at all. They're sort of neutral. Um, so what you want to do is you want to allow the 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 redness of the dusty areas to pass through and block out everything else which is that gray color so you add you actually add to the contrast by matching the color of mars itself which is kind of an it's not really red you know it's called the red planet but um but you allow the red uh you allow the uh uh orange light of Mars, the sort of peach color of light of Mars to pass. And that, that enhances the contrast of the, of the, uh, the, the, the features on Mars. Um, for things like clouds and the polar caps and that kind of thing, I found exactly the opposite is the case. You want to kind of mute the red areas. And uh, to do that, you would use a blue filter. Uh, in order to uh, to look now, I I found that the really dark blue filters, you know, the ones that are sort of a vivid violet or whatever, um, those are hard to actually see anything through. You know, I, I found my eyes don't really respond to those. But a real, just a little light blue filter, kind of like a little sky blue filter, actually does a good job of damping down the uh, tamping down the uh, the light of the of the uh, this body of the planet and bringing out any fog or haze or that kind of thing. Mars will often have uh, fog in the morning, so the thing, the part of Mars that's turning into view, will have a little bit of a little bit of uh, fog in it. Or Olympus Mons will sometimes have a little bit of a cloud layer on top that's very hard to see. But if you put a blue filter on, um, you can actually see it. The first time I ever actually saw clouds over Olympus Mons was through a light blue filter. So, and that's about filters. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. You can see clouds on Mars. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's amazing.